Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Today's talk is going to be a quick update on a few new things in the opportunistic infection guidelines. And so, just to clarify, I do not have any disclosures. And these are going to be the four things that I'm briefly going to discuss in approximately the next 15 minutes or so. I'm going to briefly discuss a little bit about the timing of the pneumococcal vaccine. Next, I'm going to talk about new recommendations that are out for people with HIV related to treatment of community-acquired pneumonia. Third, some of the logistical issues that you will need to think about if you are considering using short course treatment for latent tuberculosis infection. And then last, where we're at with MAC prophylaxis. Okay, so the first thing is pneumococcal vaccine. Just to remind everybody that there are two basic types of pneumococcal vaccines. We have a polysaccharide vaccine and we have a conjugate vaccine. And I wanted to conceptually just distinguish these two by first of all just showing you this image to remind you that pneumococcus is a gram-positive organism that has a very significant outer capsule and this outer capsule is made up of polysaccharide. So the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine is actually very straightforward in that they just take the different subtypes of the pneumococcal organism, grab a piece of the polysaccharide capsule, and then put these different strains in the pneumococcal vaccine. And as you know, we have the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine 23, which has 23 different serotypes of pneumococcus. And this is distinguished um, from, and this is the one you commonly know and refer to as Pneumovax. So this is to be distinguished from the conjugate vaccine, which really triggers a different immune response. It's the same basic idea of taking a piece of the outer polysaccharide capsule, but as opposed to just using that in isolation, it is conjugated to a very important protein conjugate adjuvant that really enhances the immune response to the vaccine significantly. So because of this, the idea is that you want to initiate the vaccine series with the conjugate vaccine, which really provides the more robust T cell related immune responses. And then you follow that with the polysaccharide vaccine in terms of the broader immunity with more strains. The conjugate pneumococcal vaccine that we now use is the Prevnar 13, which as you, as you know, has 13 different subtypes of pneumococcus. So what about the, the timing of this? So, and, and how many shots of this do we give? So the classic situation, you're in the clinic, you see a new person, they have a CD4 count, let's say 300, 400. How many shots of these do you give? How, what order do you do them in? And the way that I remember this is in a healthy person who's younger, you can think of it as the 1-3, like the pneumococcal PCV13-1-3. You're going to give one shot of the pneumococcal vaccine that's the, that the conjugate vaccine should be followed over a person's lifetime by three polysaccharide vaccines. And you can see this is how they're supposed to be spaced out. You give the conjugate vaccine, you wait eight weeks, you give the polysaccharide, you wait five years, then you give the second polysaccharide, and you wait until they turn 65 and then you, you give the third. So for example, 30 year old person comes in, they get their conjugate vaccine, eight weeks later, they get the polysaccharide. Age 35, they get their next polysaccharide, and then when they turn 65, they get their last dose of that. So pretty straightforward, that's how you walk through this. Now, the, the bigger question though is, what do you do and when do you start the pneumococcal vaccine if a person comes in and their CD4 counts less than 200? So what the guidelines now say is there's two different options. So the previous recommendation is, is that for anybody or, or the, for higher CD4 count, the recommendation is that you automatically wait eight weeks and then you give it. In this scenario, the guidelines actually give you the option of waiting until their CD4 count is above 200 on antiretroviral therapy. And this actually, when you look at the guidelines, is slightly preferred. The rest of the cascade of giving the polysaccharide vaccine remains exactly the same. So the only real difference is you can wait until their virologic, until they reach virologic control and their CD4 count is greater than 200. So just to summarize then, the timing of the polysaccharide vaccines are different than the conjugate. Conjugate vaccine, you give regardless of CD4 count. There's no reason to delay. 
But the first polysaccharide, you have two different options. You can wait until the CD4 counts above 200, or you can actually defer. So it's a little bit different than in individuals who have a CD4 count less than 200. So the key thing for you, first visit, um, you know, you, you, it may be too much for a person to get all of this at one time. There's nothing wrong with waiting four or eight weeks to get them uh, their first dose of the conjugate vaccine because sometimes you don't want to bombard people at their initial visit with a whole bunch of vaccines along with trying to start them on antiretrovirals. Okay, what about community-acquired pneumonia? So the question is now, what is recommended for the treatment of community-acquired pneumonia in persons with HIV? So these guidelines just got updated in September and they are basically in line with new American Thoracic Society IDSA guidelines. And this is really, I think, going to be for some people a change in maybe what they've done in the past. But the preferred options for people with HIV and community-acquired pneumonia treated as an outpatient are now combination therapy with a beta-lactam plus a macrolide. And the macrolide should be either azithromycin or clarithro, the beta-lactam, amoxicillin, or amoxclav. So that's combination therapy that has an A1 rating or a fluoroquinolone with levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. So those are now the preferred recommendations for people with HIV. Monotherapy with azithromycin is no longer recommended for people with HIV. Alternative could be a beta-lactam plus doxycycline. You know, for example, somebody maybe was intolerant to azithromycin in the past. So the question is, why now have the macrolides sort of been moved to a little bit more of a, a cautious role where they're not used alone. And it's based on these data that came out in 2016 from the active bacterial core surveillance. And basically, the susceptibility of these different antibiotics to pneumococcus has changed over time. And what you can see here now is that with erythromycin, which is a surrogate for susceptibility with azithromycin and clarithromycin has really now decreased now to only approximately 70 percent of the isolates um, being susceptible um, so with pneumococcus so this is this is i think a change in overall in the community and this is a change if you look at the ats idsa guidelines you'll see some changes in that that may be new for you as well too Let's turn to short course treatment for latent TB. There's some updated recommendations in the guidelines for this. So first of all, just to remind everybody what the standard is, the preferred remains giving people nine months of INH for uh, latent tuberculosis infection. And one of the things that gets very confusing now is that in the literature and in the guidelines, there's a lot of use of these abbreviations, 9H, 3HP, 4R, 1HP, all of these. Where do they get these abbreviations? I'll go through that. The 9H is derived from H from the INH. So why it's not I, it's not clear, but it's INH, and they use 9H as these abbreviations. And that is currently still the standard. What's new or they've updated the recommendations for short course, which there are two options now, INH plus rifapentine or rifampin. The INH rifapentine, the H again from the INH, the rifapentine, they use the P from rifapentine, that's how you get 3HP, three months of the H and the P, the INH and the rifapentine. Rifampin, they use the R for that, and that's 4R, four months of rifampin. So now short course, really, the options for you are three months of INH rifapentine or four months of rifampin. That is our short course options. Now, what are the logistics of this? So what antiretroviral therapy regimen can be used if you're going to use the three-month INH rifapentine, which is the 3HP for latent tuberculosis? So think about that for a second. See if you can come up with this on your own. What antiretrovirals? It is slim. So here's what you, you can look at. So the NRTIs are generally okay, but not TAF. So if you use the 3HP, TAF is out. So most of the initial regimens that everybody's using, you're not going to be having people on TAF-based regimens. In NRTIs, efavirenz is fine. It's standard dose. PIs, none of them are considered acceptable and the integrase strand transfer inhibitors only raltegravir. So you can see really probably what you're going to have somebody on if you're on 3-HP is a regimen like TDF, FTC, plus raltegravir. That's probably what you're really left with, standard dose raltegravir. Now, what about if you want to use rifampin for the four-month 
regimen, the 4R regimen for rifampin for latent tuberculosis. What antiretrovirals do we have that we can use? So there's a couple slight changes in this. So the NRTI is generally considered okay. Previously, TAF was out completely, but they've now looked at some recent data on this and found that TAF is probably going to be okay. So they now say caution with TAF. There may be some adjustments in levels. Efavirenz at standard dose is, is, is recommended. And then the integrase inhibitors, you can double the doses and use these. So dolutegravir BID, rautegravir 800 BID. So you can see it's a little more flexible with rifampin than it is with 3-HP. My point with this is that it's really not so straightforward to use the short course therapy for latent tuberculosis. We don't quite have this down perfectly yet because of all the drug interactions. If we eventually find out that 1-HP, the one month of INH rifapentine daily, is recommended for people with HIV, that might be a little easier because you just have to make these med adjustments for a month versus a, a three to four month period. Okay, let's last turn very briefly to primary prophylaxis for disseminated MAC. This has undergone a significant change in the past three to four years based on evolving data and based on different guideline changes. So the question now is what is recommended for initiating primary MAC prophylaxis in persons with HIV who have a CD4 count less than 50? For those of you that have been practicing doing HIV for a number of years, all of you probably remember very clearly the dogma that we all had was if a person presented with a CD4 count less than 50, we always used to put them on prophylaxis with usually azithromycin given 1,200 milligrams once a week or 600 milligrams on one day and then 600 milligrams the next day. And that was really the dogma for a number of years. And then the IAS USA came out with some recommendations saying maybe we don't need to do this in everybody if we're actually going to start them on antiretroviral therapy. But the OI guidelines in the HHH really held firm with still going ahead and, and keeping people on uh, this plan of initiating prophylaxis for MAC. This just changed in the most recent guidelines in February, and it's now recommended do not even start them on prophylaxis if you're going to initiate antiretroviral therapy. So it went from, you know, you could consider, maybe you could go both ways. Now they clearly recommend not administering primary prophylaxis for persons that are going to immediately initiate antiretroviral therapy. And the question is, how did they get to these recommendations based on data? And a couple of things. First of all, in the modern era, the number of people getting disseminated MAC has gone down dramatically. So this was more recent data where they looked at the overall incidence of MAC rate per 100 person months. And I can tell you that this is dramatically less than it was 15, 20 years ago uh, in the heyday of when we used to see a lot of disseminated MAC disease. And, and these numbers are very low and you can see there, they're very low and there's not a big difference in people getting this, whether or not they got MAC prophylaxis or not. This follow-up uh, data or additional data actually shows that the viral load was very predictive. So if you had a viral load that was under 10,000, um, you can see that the, the incidence of, of getting uh, MAC was very, very low. And if your viral load was less than 1,000, it was essentially non-existent. So what a lot of people have considered and said, well, in the day and age of what we do now, which is to use integrase strand transfer inhibitors for almost everyone for initial therapy, where you get very rapid viral decays, and within two months, you can see that most people are going to have, you know, very low likelihood of, of developing MAC, even within several weeks, because you're going to get your viral loads down under 1,000 in most people within two to four weeks. So the bottom line is, is that, it just doesn't make sense now to start MAC prophylaxis on people if you're going to initiate antiretroviral therapy right away. A lot of people say to me, you know, or they've, they've asked and said, well, what if they're, they're not going to start on antiretroviral therapy? Shouldn't you go ahead and initiate it? And I, I guess you could say yes, but then I would turn that around and say, why would we ever be starting MAC prophylaxis and not giving somebody antiretrovirals? So in some ways, it's a moot argument because I think anybody who really isn't willing to take antiretroviral therapy, it's probably going to be hard to get them to take um, azithromycin on a weekly basis, on a regular basis. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. 
If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off. Thank you.